we move toward the car show with that. Amen. Got your Bibles? Mm-hmm. Open to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll be starting in verse 7 in just a minute. Last week, I preached a message to you called The Struggle is Real. As a matter of fact, if you haven't picked up yet, we're, we're doing a series on no pain, no gain. Amen. It's something I learned years ago when I was a young man playing football. I'd hear the phrase, no pain, no gain. And, and I realized that life has a lot of pain with it. It has some struggles with it. As a matter of fact, last week there were two main points I want to mention from last week. One is be a student and not a victim. Don't be a victim in this society and in life. Don't allow life or other people to make you a victim. Be a student. Learn something in the pain you're going through. And the second point, probably the most powerful point, was excessive prolonged sorrow is selfish. I'm going to say that again. Excessive prolonged sorrow is selfish. Many times we sorrow. I'm, I'm honestly in sorrow right now. I've dealt with some things over the last few days that have put my heart into a place of, of sorrow, and I'm going through it. And I know that the weeping comes and and weeping may happen over the night, but joy comes in the morning. Uh, James says, count it all, consider it all joy. I know on the other side there will be some joy, but I, I have to allow sorrow to have its place. Amen. So sorrow is not a bad thing for you. It's a human emotion that God put inside of you. But if you prolong it and if you're excessive with it, then watch this. Then you can't sorrow when I'm sorrow. Amen. Now you're selfish and it's all about you. Uh, you are never going to get that. You may never get that spouse back. You may never get that friend back. You may never get that job back. There may be people that have died in your life. You'll never get them back. Amen. And you got to realize that I got to go on. Amen. You're not helping anybody by wallowing in your sorrow. Get through it, weep, and move on to the new day. Can I get an amen? I say and ask you to keep uh, a, friend, a family in prayer also. The Cobb family, Linda and Robert Cobb. They're very dear friends of ours who rode scooters with us. Linda's been fighting cancer since 2003, and she's in hospice care now. And I think Linda is 63 years of age, and uh, she's been a very dear friend. I mean, very kind, and uh, that's where I'm hurting right now, you know, because you just, well, you're with people, and you love them. Yesterday I did a, a funeral of a, of a biker, and seven weeks ago they took a picture of him riding his bike with no hands. Going down the road, he got this big beard and stuff. He's just a, 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 just a free-loving fellow, man. And uh, he loved the church, loves Jesus, loves me, loved me, passed away. And they brought a carriage out. I watched you walk around it, Joseph. You're staring at that. They had a trike out there with a, with a hearse attached to it, Kenny. Had glass all the way around it. And I thought, that's the coolest thing. I had to get on it and get a picture with it, you know. So I thought, I might want to buy one of these one day if I keep doing all these funerals. It's just uh, careful. Somebody say, pain happens. Say it again, pain happens. Oh, man, it happened. David, you, you hit your finger and it happened. James has just exited out of the building. You know, last week, James, a, a week ago Friday, just had a brand new motorcycle and somebody rear -end, a drunk rear-ended him here in Crosby. Amen. And just shoved him through to 13 miles on the bike. Bruises all over him. But yet he gets up and he keeps on going. He comes out to the ranch. We start yanking fence and doing stuff out there and he's helping us. And all of a sudden he walks away and I thought, I wonder where James went. And then we went to the office, got some water. James comes in and his hand wrapped in a towel and he got hold of a set of shears, them electric shears and his hand slipped off of it, cut the end of his finger off. Pain! happens. Amen. He sat there with his, let's go sew that thing back on. And I love getting around a nurse that's excited about sewing stuff like that back on. She, I, we walked into one of these urgent cares. She said, oh, I take care of that. Amen. She grabbed the end of that finger and shoved it back on there and started sewing through the nail and putting it back on. And she was having a delightful time. Gave him a shot in the rear. I mean, she, and then she looked at me and I was like, you know what? I want to take care of this, ma'am. He did this on our property, I'll take you. I said, how much is it? She looked at me and she said, $100. I said, $100? You should have I injured him a little bit more. I mean, that's pretty inexpensive for a finger getting sold back on. And she looked at me and she said, I can do it. It's my business. I like somebody that owns their own place that can do it. And, she, and it's just the fellowship that we had while we were there that affected her and you know, but pain happens. Amen. It just, there's no way you can get away from it. Some of you might get up through a whole day without pain, and then he wakes up. Well, you'll get that later. Cheryl, right here, stay with me. 
This is, this, I'm, I'm, I'm 60 years old, so I do remember this guy named Jack Benny. Some of you might remember Jack Benny. He was a real comedian and a funny guy. And the late Jack Benny once remarked, I really don't deserve this. He got an award for his TV antics and stuff. And so when he received his award, he said, I really don't deserve this. But I have arthritis, and I don't deserve that either. Amen. Such is life. Amen. Amen. Uh, the following are actual responses from comments. Uh, comment cards given to the staff members of Bridger Wilderness Area. Bridger Wilderness Area is in the Great Tetons in Wyoming. Amen. And this is what the people said. They dropped the comment cards about this trail, this walking trail. And they said, trails need to be wider so people can walk while holding hands. Trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. Too many bugs and leeches and spiders and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness to rid the areas of these pests. Please pave the trails so they can be snow plowed during the winter. Chairlifts need to be in some places so that we can get to wonderful views without having to hike to them. The coyotes made too much noise last night and kept me awake. Please eradicate these annoying animals. A small deer came into my camp and stole my jar of pickles. Is there a way I can get reimbursed? Reflectors need to be placed on trees every 50 feet so people can hike at night with flashlights. Escalators would help on steep uphill sections. A McDonald's would be nice on the trailhead. The places where, this, these are actual comments that people make. To the, the, the places where trails do not exist are not well marked. I'm going to say that again. The places where trails do not exist are not well marked. Too many rocks in the mountain. We're not fond of pain, are we? We just don't, don't, you don't even want people to comment on pain or even slight discomfort. We rebel at the suggestion of it. We recoil at the sight of it. And we reject the suggestion that it might be good for us. But the lessons of life are almost always taught in the classroom of suffering. It's never in the softness, but it's in the suffering. Whether you're suffering through, uh, you know, an elementary school spelling quiz dealing with excruciating pain of disease or the heartbreak of grief. One thing I've learned is that when I'm walking through the Word of God, I see pain all through from Genesis to Revelation. And one man who was not able to uh, avoid it was Paul the Apostle. Paul, the, the, the man who was Saul, who carried the, the, the degrees or the paperwork to have Christians annihilated, to have them executed, who was there when Stephen was stoned to death, who God turned around, amen, knocked to the ground, blinded him, and, and turned his life around, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, most of them while he was in prison. Amen. Was not a man who was away from pain. He understood it. His work changed the world, literally, in places like Athens, Ephesus, and Corinth. The once powerful temples and religion of the Greek gods that so dominated his culture are in ruins, and yet billions have and are reading Paul's letters today, memorizing passages in Afghanistan and China and other places where you're not allowed to have a Bible. They're reading and getting hold of Paul's words that he wrote in prison, amen, and following the instructions as if Paul was still preaching his passionate message in our culture. Are you comfortable? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. I do appreciate you being here on this Labor Day weekend and grabbing this word. For those that have been listening to us online, it's, just, it's such a pleasure when I hear that. I would never know if people do or don't until they tell me. And so uh, I thank God that somehow the message is still going forth. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. To keep me from becoming conceited. Woo! That's one right off the bat. You know, sometimes I literally am in my car, in my very fast car, my very fine, fast car, and I'll be singing an old Mac Davis song to myself. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in so many ways. Y'all don't know that song, do you? And then I read what Paul said. Woo! To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, the things that I understand about the Word of God. There was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan. David, when he came in this morning, he pointed his hand at me, and he has, looks like a thorn in your flesh. He'll show it to you after church. Uh, but it's just protruding, and I, all I want to do is just take my knife and cut it. You know, I just want to lance it. Because you ever get a thorn in your flesh, 
amen, it'll fester up, it, it gets infected, and it's sometimes almost impossible to get out, amen. He said, that's what this was, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Three times I asked God, take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Are you reading in the red in your Bible? That tells me that Jesus is talking. Three times, three times I pleaded. Do you know when Jesus, when Paul said, three times I prayed, Jesus, take it away. And Jesus said, yeah, I remember pleading three times also. Amen. Not my will be done, but thine. Not my will be done in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, but thine. Not mine, but thine. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Father, I thank you for the Word of God. We understand that pain happens. Help us to discover revelation through this message and through life. I love you. Bless your people today. In Jesus' name, and everyone say amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. Pain happens. From a logical point of view, it would seem that God would reward those who do good with less pain. You'd think that, you know, if I did real well, if I prayed a lot, if I witnessed a lot, if, if I saw miracles happen in my life, then I'd have less pain. Certainly it would seem that way that God would give those in Christian ministry a free pass from pain. Hey, after all, I am the preacher. Surely I could get a pass from this. After all, missionaries, church planners, and pastors work for God. Would it be a good idea then? Would it be uh, in your power, Lord, amen, to take special care of those who work for you? But it's not so. It seems like those who serve God the most in whatever area, and I'm not trying to make big eyes and little use. I'm just trying to say, if you're serving God the most, it seems like you endure the most pain. Amen. You, uh, you feel it more. Paul didn't get a pass from pain. In fact, as he set out about his world planting churches and becoming the leader of the evangel evangelistic movement, amen, among Gentiles, he seemed to endure an incredible amount of pain. If I tell you that he had a resume, when somebody brought it up and they said that there were certain guys preaching Christ and doing this and doing that, he had a resume. He had something that he could come out and say, and, he, and this is what he said in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three: Are they Christ's servants? Are they? It's insane to say it, but I'm a far better one. I've done much more work, been in prison more times, been beaten more severely, have faced death more often. Five times the Jewish leaders have, have had me beaten with 39 lashes. Three times the Roman officials had me beaten with clubs. Once people tried to stone me to death, three times I was shipwrecked. You know, people talk about riding motorcycles with me, say, Pastor, every time I ride a bike with you, we get wet. It rains. But Paul, every time he got in a boat, it wrecked. Amen. Every time they put him on a ship, it seemed like the thing would wreck. He said, as a matter of fact, I was adrift on the sea for a night and a day. Because I've traveled a lot, I've faced dangers from raging rivers, from robbers, from my own people, and from other people. I've faced dangers in the city, in the open country, on the sea, and from believers who turned out to be false friends. Because I've had to work so hard, I've often gone without sleep, been hungry and thirsty, and gone without food and without proper clothes during cold weather. Besides these external matters, I have the daily pressure of my anxiety about all the churches. I'm still concerned about the churches. When anyone is weak, I'm weak too. When anyone is caught in a trap, I'm also harmed. So you got to hear this again. Multiple imprisonments, beatings, floggings. Uh, uh, they beat him with a cane, life-threatening experiences, stoning, shipwreck. Night and day, floating in the open sea. Uh, he hadn't always had enough food, clothes, sleep, friends. He'd been chased by bandits, infuriated re uh, religious leaders. He battled temptation and anxiety. And over all of that, he said, God put a thorn in my flesh. God put a thorn in my flesh. After I went through all of this, you think all of that's enough. And three times I've prayed that this thorn would be released from me. And many times in our life, we're always praying for relief and relief and relief, but pain happens. It doesn't just go away. Amen. We've got to be able to deal with it and learn from this thorn that he said. It's straight from hell. Amen. It's bad. If you read the passage closely enough, it was a messenger from Satan. Amen. It's like Satan sent his best one to give me a hard time. He tormented me. Perhaps, I, you know, and I, I don't know what the thorn was. I, I actually told my pastor this morning, I will not speculate on it. I've heard different people tell me what they thought it was. To me, it doesn't matter. Paul didn't tell me what it was, so I don't need to know. 
Amen. But I can tell you this, it bothered him. And many of us have this certain uh, weakness, this, this thing that, that bothers us, that, that, that uh, just keeps rising up. We pray and ask God to help us, help us with this, whether it be an addiction that keeps trying to come back on of our life, amen, certain people that keep trying to come back in our life, certain things that keep happening. It just keeps, God, I just keep on praying. But he understood that I can get through this. As a matter of fact, this thing kept me from getting conceited, getting arrogant, from being prideful, amen, because I understand that falls come after the pride. So perhaps it's a, an excruciating uh, uh, things that you've gone through, whether it be a cancer or a bad pain, amen, uh, one who suffers from Lou Gehrig's disease or arthritis or multiple sclerosis or any number of stunning array of diseases, disabilities, discouragements that can come our way. Paul asked God to remove the pain. So do we, don't we? Amen. Why do you pray unless you ask God to take away the pain? Well, whatever it might have been, perhaps Paul explained why it would be a good idea to have the pain removed. He could, he could have said, God, I can plant more churches. I can be able to heal more people. I can witness and share the gospel more if you take this pain away. But it, but it didn't happen. Acts 19.11 tells us that God worked through this man over and over. God worked unusual miracles through Paul. People would take handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched Paul's skin to those who were sick. Their sickness would be cured, and evil spirits would leave them. I've done this through my, it seemed like my whole ministry, where I've taken bandanas and taken it to hospitals. This man showed up from New Orleans. He said, Pastor, before I ever left, 16 years ago after Katrina, to go back to New Orleans, you gave me a bandana. You prayed over it. And he showed me a picture of it. It's still hanging on his rearview mirror, and it's, it's chipped away. It's faded. It's, 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 it looked like mice have been eating on the thing. He said, I still got it. I mean, how many in here got a bandana from me? Get your hand down. Amen. You're making everybody else jealous. What I'm telling you is I've learned that if, if Paul did this, and I've seen people healed and blessed and, and encouraged, and, and it gives, it, there's no power in this, but there's power in faith and believing God and having something to hold on to. And remember, and not only that, when I see this, I remember the pain I was in. Amen. When, you know, I remember going to see Bryce when he was just a little baby before I met you guys. I remember the pain I was in when I was going through it. So, so this is a, re, is, a, is a symbol of pain and not only that, of deliverance, of healing. Amen. Paul said, this is what I did as I went through life. So Paul asked again and again on three separate occasions. Amen. He pulled out all the stops. He asked God for a miracle of his own. You've been healing other people. And this is the hard thing. Amen. You've been healing other people, God. Amen. I pray over them, they get healed, and I still limp. I still struggle. You're healing them, but I'm still struggling with my own life. Why, why can't you take? See, these are the mysteries of life. Amen. I, I, I still got this thorn in my flesh that doesn't seem to go away. I mean, it seems silly to make the case that pain is, is a part of life. Life starts with a good slap on the butt. Come on. Amen. I don't know about you, but that's what my mama told me about me. The first sweet thing that happened to me when I was born, they held me upside down and slapped my butt. Amen. Until I started crying. Ah! Amen. And been getting slapped on the butt ever since. Here's a really important question. Will you find the positives in your pain? Last week we talked about James when he says, consider it all joy. It's hard to find joy in the pain. Amen. But he said, you got to consider it. You got to welcome this because something good is going to happen here. You, you, you're you're going to become more patient with it. Now, Paul's going on to say that it has a purpose in the midst of pain that will not leave. You might be able to discover at least part of the purpose of it. Amen. That kind of process leads to a maturity found through no other process. Maturity is found. Amen. How are you going to handle it? These lessons that can be learned only in the classroom of suffering and only the student enrolled there is allowed to make the discovery. Look at it. Paul concluded for himself that this thorn, his thorn, was meant to keep him from becoming conceited about his miraculous life, revelations, and ministry. Here's some positive purposes. Acts chapter 16. On the day of worship, he went out of the city. To a place. I'm going, to, I'm going to back up some here just a little bit, so don't get nervous there, Mike. Amen. Acts 16, verse 13 says, They went along the, the river where he thought Jewish people gathered for prayer. He sat down and began talking to a woman who had gathered there. A woman named Lydia was present. Well, she was a convert to Judaism from the city of Thyatira and sold purple dye for a living. She was listening because the Lord made her willing to pay attention to what Paul said. Then Lydia and her family were baptized. She invited us to stay at her home. And she said, if you're convinced that I believe in the Lord, then stay at my home. She insisted, so we did. Now, let's pick it up in verse 16. 
One day where, when he was going to the place of prayer, a female servant met us. She was possessed by an evil spirit that told fortune. She made a lot of money for her owners by telling fortunes. She used to follow Paul and shout, these men are the servants of the Most High God. They're telling you how you can be saved. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. That's a good word. Amen. She followed him. She's saying all that. She kept doing this for many days. Paul became annoyed. Have you ever got annoyed with some overly spiritual people? Amen. To keep telling you and becoming redundant over the same thing over and over. Amen. They're just redundant. Just say the same thing. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. Or as my dad used to say, go to hell. Amen. He would, he was, he would, he would witness too all the time. But where was I here? She kept doing this for many days. Paul became annoyed, turned to the evil spirit and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. As Paul said this, the evil spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them to the authorities in the public square. Next question here. Have you ever noticed how many things are motivated by money? I want you to take a really good, truthful look at our government right now and realize what's all being motivated by money. And big pharma and how they, they're using things to keep fear stirred among the people. Now, I'm going to tell you again to you, I am not anti-vax. I'm pro-freedom. They gave $500 at the Methodist Hospital, or I think Baylor Hospital, if you go get your shot there, 500 bucks. Wow, that's pretty good. $100 one shot, $50 for the next shot. Once you get to your seventh shot, you're going to get a whole set of Ginzu knives. Mm-hmm. Amen. I'm not against you getting it. I'm just telling you that this thing, follow the money. So they shut, they shut her down. The demon came out of her. Now she's born again. And now her, her masters, the ones who were using her, are mad because they're losing money on her. This, the, uh, the sex trade in America? Come on. Drugs, alcohol, all are motivated by money. You know, when I got born again, I quit drinking, quit smoking, quit drugs. I, you know what? I, I was able to give my tithe and still make money. I was able to give 10% of my income and still make money. Amen, because I quit those things and that people were making money off of me with. This is all through Scripture. She kept doing this. In verse 19, her owners realized their hope of make, making money was gone. They grabbed Paul and Silas, dragged them into the authorities in the public square. In front of the Roman officials, they said, these men are stirring up a lot of trouble in our city. They're Jews. They're, not trust, they're just cast out a devil. Amen. And they're advocating customs we can't accept or practice as Roman citizens. No, they didn't. They just cast out a devil. The crowd joined in the attack. Oh, you get that mob stirred up real good against Paul and Silas. And the officials tore their clothes off Paul and Silas. Ordered. They ordered the guards to beat them with sticks. After they, and here's Paul going, all I did was cast out a devil. And they start beating him with sticks. Amen. And they forced uh, Paul and Silas. Amen. After they did that. They, 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 they threw them in the jail and ordered the jailer to keep them under a tight uh, security. One scripture said he put them in the inner or the below jail, amen, down below. So the jailer followed these orders and put Paul and Silas in the solitary confinement with their feet and leg irons. Feet and leg irons, but their hands are free. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns and praise to God, and other prisoners were listening to them. Now, I got issues here. I, I just think I got to think. First off, how did they know it was midnight? They're in the bottom of the prison, but they know it's midnight. They, 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 the hours are ticking by. And Paul looks over at Silas and says, Silas, uh, what's your fossil watch say? Uh, it's about midnight, Paul. Amen. And then they begin to sing praises, and I want to go into all of that. But as they begin to sing, as they begin to worship, there's something peculiar because most of us, when we're going through pain, when we've been be beaten uh, illegally, when we've been put in jail illegally, uh, when, when mobs are against us, but God is for us, our, our, our objective normally is to whine and to cry and, and to uh, um, whine and cry. I'll stop there before I cuss. That's not cussing. I can say female dog. Okay. Uh, but they do that. They just, just keep on around going. And, and, when, and when doing that, it, it wouldn't help. But there at the bottom of that prison, Paul began to find peace in his pain. And he began to find purpose in it. And there he looks at Silas, and he has somebody two by two. Hallelujah. 
and he begins to sing. And as he began to worship God, something happened in the heaven. And God reached down from the heaven, and he wrapped his arm around the jail. And he squeezed the jail to hug his two favorite servants at that time, who in their pain found some type of discovery and purpose. In their pain, they realized at this moment, there's nothing else that we can do. Our legs are fastened. We may die in the morning. They are against us. But the last thing I'm going to do on this earth is give my God some praise. So they begin to praise God. And as they praised God, God reached down to hug that jail. Amen. And suddenly a violent earthquake shook the foundations of the jail. All the doors immediately flew open. All the prisoners' chains came loose. It was like angels went through there with keys and began to open up all of the, all of the prisoners. Everybody was opened up inside. The, dales, the doors are flinging open. Amen. The jailer woke up and he saw the prison doors open, thinking the prisoners had, prisoners had escaped. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he knew had anyone escaped, they were going to kill him. Amen. It might torture his family. So he, he at that moment began to do that. Paul shouted loudly as he could. It's the midnight hour. The prison has busted open. He probably seen the glimmer of the moon shine off the sword of the jailer. And he yelled at him, whoa, do yourself no harm. We're here. Not only are we here, but everybody is still here. Now, unless you've been jailed, you don't know what I'm talking about, but I've been in jail. And I know that at the door's been opened, Everybody would have split. But when you're in the midst of a Holy Ghost revival, amen, and God has showed up, amen, and the prisoners are singing, every, the Bible says everybody heard them. I, lo I, I just love, I love, 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 love when you're in church, and you can hear a man singing across the room. Now, I, I love hearing the women sing, but women have been singing forever. Amen. All the way back to Jeremiah talks about the women wailing and the women singing. Women been running. Women been doing it. Women, women can get loud in church. But a man sat there. But this moment, Paul and H.D. are in prison. And everybody heard him when he began to sing. Amen. And then he said, hey, don't you go nowhere. We're all still here. That's a miracle. Nobody left his prison yet. The jailer asked for torches, rushed into the jail. He was trembling as he knelt in front of Paul and Silas. Then he took Paul and Silas aside, and he asked him, Sirs, you know, you know how you do it. This is like that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. They asked him about salvation. I call him Nick at night. Amen. He showed up. So this is that same thing. Come here, guys. Come here. I've got to ask you a question. How do I get saved? How, how do I get what you got? How can I go through pain? And deal with life the way you guys, I know y'all were mistreated. I know they lied about y'all. I know y'all cast out a devil. Y'all set that girl free. And you cost people money. That's why they put you in jail. How can I get what y'all got? I got to know that. Oh, it's good. In the morning, okay, he took Paul and Silas. And, and uh, I got to find out where I'm at. What verse am I at? Thank you. They answered. Uh, he said, oh, I love this. Acts 16, 31. I should know this. This is a verse I claim for my family until they all got born again. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and your household will be saved. Hang on to that promise. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, and you and your household will be saved. They spoke the, words, the Lord's word to the jailer and everyone in his home. At that hour of the night, the jailer washed Paul and Silas' wounds. Come on, Jesus. Man, when you appreciate people, you appreciate ministry, you appreciate folk, he washed their wounds. The jailer and his entire family were baptized immediately. He took Paul and Silas upstairs into his home and gave them something to eat. He and his family were thrilled to be believers in God. In the morning, the Roman official sent guards who told the jailer, you can release those men now. <laughs> you let them go now. They, they've, been, they've been released since midnight. Amen. They've been baptizing folk. We've been feeding them. We washed their wounds. They've been good. Hey, you, you, you can, but we want everybody to know that we said you can release them. The jailer reported this, this order to Paul by saying, the officials have sent word. The officials from D.C. have sent the word to release you so you can leave peacefully. Now, Paul told the guards, the Roman officials have, not, have had us beaten publicly without a trial, have thrown us in jail, and even though they were Roman citizens now, they, uh, now are they going to throw us out secretly? There's no way they're going to get away with that. Have them escort us out. See, this is what I love. Once you got the upper hand, once you got God on your side, once everything rocking on for you, then you stand up and you say, hold on just a minute. You beat me when you shouldn't have. 
You try, you didn't even try me. Now you're going to let me go secretly as if nothing was wrong? I want you to come and escort us out. Send one of your entourages, amen, to get us out of here. Hallelujah. Roman officials had us beaten publicly without trial. Even verse 38, the guards escorted to the official, reported to the officials what Paul had said. Then the Roman officials heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. They were afraid. <laughs> we should have checked their ID before we beat them. So the officials went to the jail and apologized to Paul and Silas. As the officials escorted Paul and Silas out of the jail, they asked him, please leave the city. Here in Philippi, Paul and Silas, they're beaten publicly. You see what's going on here. But in their pain, God showed up. In their pain, amen, God showed up. Hallelujah. Only the pain of Pearl Harbor and 9-11 mobilized this nation to take action against those needed to be taken action against. First in World War II and now in global war against terror. And in both of those cases, the pain of great loss clouds the vision of pain's purpose. We forget there was purpose to it. The same is true for our personal pain. In the midst of the suffering, it is extremely difficult to find the purpose in it. Paul did. Amen. And he celebrated that purpose. Discovering the purpose. In the midst of pain, there's an opportunity, faith, maturity, that could accelerate your Christian growth like nothing else. If you can learn to take this pain and say, God, help me in the name of Jesus to discover and find out why it's going on. God, I don't know the purpose of it, but I trust you have a purpose in it. Amen. We, you know, and I don't have time to preach all this, but you remember Joseph's life. Amen. Joseph, the young boy, was thrown into a pit. Amen. They considered him dead. His dad did. They took his coat, dipped it in blood, then he put him into uh, uh, Potiphar's house. Amen. And there was a trumped-up charge against him. He ended up in prison. If you look at this, his life, it took 15, 16 years before it was all over with. Amen. 15, 16 years before he finally got to an answer where he said, you know, you meant it for evil, but God meant this pain for good. Can I get an amen? Pain has a power. i got to start closing with something here. Amen. In this particular passage, Paul begins to read re a special message from the Lord. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He says, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you. This is after he talks about the thorn. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. The message and the messenger gave Paul a tremendous boost. you, you got to note something here, and you got to understand some timelines. Paul, when he met Jesus, okay, on the road to Damascus, when he was knocked down and he was blinded, Jesus had resurrected. Five years later, five years later, we find Paul. So from, when you're reading the book of Acts, you got to realize it took five years to find him. Then God speaks to him at this moment. Then two weeks later, God says to him, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance. Come on. Hey. And, and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about you. This happened two weeks after he got born again. The next word he gets from God is 16 years later. And then after that word, six years later. See, many of us think that God talks to folk all the time. Well, you know, the Lord said to me, the Lord, well, that's, that, that's not, you don't get the red. The red ain't talking to Paul that much. But what God said to him was, share this word with the Gentiles. And that's what he did. He kept around. Sometimes you've got to keep living on the word you heard years ago. Amen. You can't just say, I got to have something fresh. I got to hear something new. Now, what did God say to me years ago? And by the way, we got his word right here. I can go through his word right now. I, don't, I, I got what he says. I can read it and say, you know what? I'm going to make that word my word. That's why I say Acts 16, 31 is my word. Hallelujah. I can take that word and apply it to my life and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and me and my household, my sphere of influence will be saved. Amen. So according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that we read in the beginning, Paul felt like he had been conceited, arrogant, and there was a messenger sent to buffet him. In other words, Paul decided he was fine with the pain. If Christ's power was upon him in the pain, then he would rather have the strength of Christ than his own weakness. I've got to a place in my life in an understanding where <coughs> I realize I'm, I will live with the pain. You know, I've, I've had surgeries, born with muscular dystrophy. I'm not the most intellectual guy in the world. I have pains. But I live among people with pain, too. Everybody I know got some kind of pain. Amen. I could say more funny things about your pain, but I won't. 
But you, have you noticed how people listen to people in pain with a special intensity? When I, yesterday when I was at the hospital with Miss Linda, I listened to every word because she's in pain. I love you, Pastor. We talk about memories. We walk down memory lane just a little bit. It was Miss Linda that said to me, I said to myself, self? Man, I preached a whole sermon about that once, how we talk to ourselves. When people are in pain, you listen just a little bit more. You pick up just a little bit more. Pain happens. It has a purpose, and it has a power. The beauty of a single pearl. My mom had pearls. And then she had some pearls that were yellow. I think they were plastic. She let us play with those. But then they're real pearls. You know what I'm talking about. That, that pearl, that string of the precious stones is unmistakable. It's few jewels capture the eye quite like a perfect pearl. That, just perfectly round. How God allowed that to be formed. And you got to know that it began first with a little grain of sand. And that sand became an irritant inside of an oyster. And immediately it causes discomfort with no way to expel or get the grain of sand out. It begins to coat it and to layer it, the line of its shell, to make it smooth. This still does not ease the oyster's suffering. Again and again, the oyster coats the sand, but all the attempts to get rid of the irritant have little effect. As far as an oyster is concerned, what we call a pearl is nothing more than a pain to it. Amen. But one day the oyster is fished from the water and open. The gem inside has amazing beauty, holds great value, all because the oyster had great suffering. Maybe then it's no accident. This last verse, Mike. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was gold, as pure as transparent glass. That the last thing or let me say, the first thing we're going to do when we get to heaven is walk through gates made of pain, pearls, to remind us of the pain that we just left. Amen? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, help us in the name of Jesus to discover in our sufferings, in our pain, that there's hope. That your gates of heaven are made from the suffering of pearls, the priceless gates, to remind us of the personal cost of great suffering that we've gone through here and that, Jesus, you went through. I thank you for your heartbeat. I thank you for your love. I ask, Lord, you to help us to discover why we're going through what we're going through. And then, Lord, if we pray once, twice, three times for something to be taken away and it's not, Help us learn to live with it and learn from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you give God a little praise in here? Amen. Hallelujah. Good to have you guys back in the house. Some of you hadn't seen in a while, so I'm always glad to have you back. A kid with some of them, I've watched you grow on Facebook. Amen. That's how my mom watches the grandkids grow. Amen on Facebook. Hallelujah. Well, I love you. If you need a tither offer an envelope, it should be in front of you. We thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Your, your giving is so important in this house. There's so many things that we got to take care of, particularly right now as we move toward two things, not only, not only the uh, Muscle Car Sunday, but two weeks after it, we have our 18th year conference, amen, as a church with special guest speaker, Pastor Mike Van Britson. And guess who's coming to play guitar? Pastor Jerry, I'm so glad you got hold of me. I would have to go to Indiana if I hadn't heard from you, but I really want to be at that conference. Amen. That'd be, Pat, that'd be Brother David Huff. Amen. Who's got to be 104 year old now. I don't know how old David Huff is, but David's going to be with us, and he, he's always excited. He looks forward to this. Amen. And so that, that makes me happy. Amen. Everybody loves the musician David Huff. My God, what a guitar picking and singing, man. So I uh, uh, look forward to seeing him here. So if you got your tithe and offering envelope, our servant leaders will come up. Amen. They're going to prepare to take your offering. Hallelujah. In the back is a crock pot. You walk by that crock pot. You say, what's that crock pot for? That crock pot is for cash. 
to help buy barbecue so we can feed people for free on September the 19th. Now, the 18th, we will have a work day. But what I need right now is for folks to sign up on one of those sign-up sheets in the back. Amen. And then, uh, by the way, can I just ask one question because I, from my benefit here? How many feel like that they're going to bring a tractor and a trailer to camp? Tom, you going to do that? You going to do that? That's two? Amen. And three. That's plenty. Okay? Three is plenty right now. All right? So, Mike, I appreciate that. We'll have the benches there. You don't have to bring the hay. We'll have benches, but we're going to need tractors and trailers to haul people. You know, we park them in the back and bring them to the front. Hallelujah. And uh, let me just, I'm going to say some more things about this. Our band has become a tremendously good worship band. Are you hearing it? Amen. I'm, they're adding pieces. Things are happening. I can just sense the worship in it. It's just uh, Josiah Ramirez is, is really doing great with it. And I told them Thursday night, there was a time we had three lead guitar players in our band. If you've been with me a long time, you know. Amen. We were a rock and roll band. That's what we were. And it was easy to do 70s music with them. And I said, I would rather have a really good worship band for 51 Sundays out of the year than to have one good rock and roll band for one Sunday out of the year. So I'm not concerned about Muscle Car Sunday. We're going to have some fun with it. But there, there are things that are changing because one thing, I'm getting older and they're getting younger. Amen. So we got that little gap there that we're working with. But we want to, here's the thing. If we could have the presence of God, not entertainment, but the presence of God. It might be a little entertaining, but the presence of God show up with 1,000, 1,500 people on Muscle Car Sunday. Amen. That will make all the difference. Amen. And that's what we want. So I'm giving you that heads up, and that's what we're going to be doing. As we give today, we're believing God for more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. All right.